Super quick recap, we won't do the big one that I've been doing every week because we're adding chapters as we go along. Um, the Israelites were put into ba Babylonian captivity. They've now since been released. Like, like there's new kings that have come in, new generations have come and gone, and uh, they've been, they've, they're out of, officially out of Babylonian captivity, but nobody was settling back into Judea. They weren't going back to their land and rebuilding Jerusalem and stuff. Eventually, this guy, this governor over that area, his name was Zerubbabel, and he was uh, commissioned to rebuild the temple, and so he was doing that. And so a batch of people went with him to rebuild the temple, and that, that was done. And then, you know, some decades later, Ezra comes along and he leads another uh, exodus, so to speak, out of the, the Babylon area. At this point, that Babylon was controlled by the Persians. And so uh, right around 458, I think it was, Ezra brings some people, some Israelites, into the Judea area. And he ends up making sure that the Levites were doing their job. <laughs> Ezra was a priest. And so he wants to make sure that the, that the Levites were doing their thing. Because what happened was people weren't coming and showing up. <laughs> they weren't showing up to the temple. And they weren't bringing in their offerings regularly. And, part of, and the Levites were like, all right, well, let's just go back to farming, I guess. You know, because <laughs> we've got to provide for ourselves. They're out. And so he kind of rallied them together. He kind of got worship going again and just leadership, leadership, good leadership, get, helping them to connect with God. So that was in 458. And then in 445 BC, uh, King Artaxerxes uh, is the king, the Persian king, and he uh, has a cupbearer by the name of Nehemiah. That's what we read about in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, and we read about that, and he was the cupbearer to the king, and he hears this report from a brother, from, from his brother, uh, um, Hanani. Or Hanani, and he comes and gives a report of what how Jerusalem is. Remember, Jerusalem's like eight nine eight nine hundred miles away, walking. Okay, walk that, <laughs> right? So it's a couple months to get there, and so he hears the news. And he's like, "How's how's our city? How's our homeland? How's our people? You know, I, what's what's going on?" I heard, I know, you know, a couple decades ago, Ezra led some people restoring worship. I heard some good things, and then his brother goes, "It's bad, man." The walls are broken down. There's, there's, tra there's trash everywhere. There's destroyed towers and walls. The gates are broken. The city's burned. Remember, it was from the siege when Babylon conquered Jerusalem. They just they wiped it all out. They destroyed the walls and the towers and the gates. They set it on fire. They destroyed the temple, right? So it was, it was still in ruins. I'm sure, the temple was rebuilt, but the, the people the, it was uninhabitable well, practically, right? Nehemiah was grieved, and we read about it in chapter. One, his prayer to God about that. He connects with God with this problem. And then in chapter 2, we see how God was stirring up the Persian king's heart to do what? To help, which is crazy. I mean, you know, it's like that he would help them. And so he's, he's like, hey, what's, what's up, Nehemiah? He's like, I'm bummed out about my city, my homeland. What's going on? And he's like, what do you mean? And so he, he ends up paying for the, re, for the materials to rebuild. He ends up uh, commissioning a guard, armed guard to, to escort him across those 800, 900 miles uh, so he could get there safely. And all the paperwork that's needed to uh, show that he's on, it's, this is official king's business. It's okay. Don't bother him. This is, a, this is a sanctioned work to rebuild these walls and towers and gates and fortify the city so it's safe from enemies because uh, that, that's what the those, those walls are for. And so uh, we read about in chapter 3 and 4, Israel is rallying together to do this huge renovation and repair project. It was a destroyed city <laughs> with wall, I mean, with destroyed walls, so many problems. And so there's this a massive um, uh, reconstruction project amidst heavy opposition, mind you. There were enemies that were threatening to kill them. I mean, this is, this is what we're dealing with here. Multi other countries were threatening to kill them. And we also read about how from the inside out there were problems. There were spies within the Israelite community, specifically the nobles. Some of the nobles were bought out by some of these people, uh, these other nations, the Moabites, the Ammonites, Arabs, other Arab nations. And they were coming against Israel. Much of like it is today. That's literally those same areas are still against Israel. It's, it's deep seated. It goes all the way back to like Abraham days. It's 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 wild. That's how deep and it in, it's ingrained into these people groups. The hatred, the racism uh, against Israel. Uh, it's terrible. Um, so, but here's what's cool. Chapter six tells us that the wall is completed in 52 days. 52 days. 
20 foot high wall, eight feet thick, two and a half miles in circumference, plus the towers, plus the gates, plus the removal of all the junk and the, and the rubble that was just smashed and laying around. And wow, what a project. People were working around the clock, around the clock, and having a sword inside. So you'd have a sword because you don't know if the army's going to come. So everybody has a sword and like a trowel, <laughs> you know, to put the spackling. I don't know what they used, but it's the stones, right? And so they're, they're uh, you know, they're, they were ready. They were prepared. And that wall is completed for in 52 days. People were fixed on God. They were fixed on the mission. They were united. And when a church family unites, boy, it's a beautiful thing. You can accomplish so much. So this is where we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 7. Read with me. Then it was when the wall was built and I had hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, and he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. And I said to them, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut and bar the doors and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his house. We'll pause there for just a second. So uh, uh, Hanani is Nehemiah's brother. Right? Who was originally, he, again, he originally in chapter 1 brought that report to Nehemiah about how messed up it was. So now Nehemiah is in, raising him up to help lead in Jerusalem. At this point, Nehemiah is governor. He's now, he is now the new governor of Judea, the entire region. So just to back up real quick. So the, the Persian king, at this point it was King Artaxerxes. Okay? He was the Persian king and he had like over a hundred territories that he was ruling over. One of them was, was the, you know, it was Israel, what we would call Israel, okay? So he would hire and appoint governors over these areas because you can't effectively make, rule, and especially in that day and age where tele, there's no telecommunications, you know, there's no texting, <laughs> there's no uh, live streams. You had to go by foot, man. You know, maybe you had a horse, it's a little faster, right? But it was, so ruling, you had to appoint people you trust, that would report back to you, right? So Nehemiah was one of those people. King already trusted him. He was the cupbearer to the king. He raises Nehemiah up and uh, as governor. And so as governor, he's like, well, I can't rule all this area either. So I'm going to raise, my brother's been faithful. He's been, he's, he's my bro. And so I'm going to, I'm going to raise him up. And so I'm going to entrust Jerusalem to him. And specifically this other guy named Hananiah as the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God. Notice it's just those, those are the qualifies, qualities. Faithful and he, and he feared God. I'm going to tell you, in my 20 plus years of ministry, 21 now, 21 years of ministry, those two qualities ring true today, don't they? Just, just stay faithful. <laughs> if I can just find somebody who's just faithful to the work, they do what they say they're going to do, and they fear God. God's always number one, and they do their work. It's so simple. I love how simple it is, but yet there's distractions that happen, right? <laughs> so that's what throws it off. But anyway, he recognized the qualities in those two men. He raises them up there. Um, Hananiah, by the way, was over, the, it says the citadel. Um, that would be, a.k.a. the Tower of David, as we call it today. That, that, by the way, that was named after King David uh, after it was built, by the way. That was in, it wasn't a tower that David himself built. It was called the Tower of David. Um, there is a picture of it, uh, and that's, that's the tall part of it right there, the little uh, crayon-looking thing. Um, so it uh, really was a, it was a fortress and a watchtower that was built. Okay? Um, this is now, by the way, uh, today, you can go see it today. Um, it might take you a while to get there. Uh, this is now a present-day museum of the, of the history of Jerusalem. Okay? I think I've got another. Just, let, just kind of give you a, This is kind of what the city would have looked like, by the way, with those walls rebuilt. Okay? You look at it and you're like, it's kind of, it's kind of small, right? <laughs> it is two and a half miles around the whole thing, though, right? So if you think of it that way. But, yeah. I have another one? No, that was it. So that's the, that's the citadel. Uh, so this guy named Hananiah, he would have been kind of over probably the city guard. 
you know, making sure that he, he was probably over the guard specifically. He, had, he was secure, head of security, <laughs> probably, something like that. And so these two men were charged with securing the city, watching the walls and gates, right? Israel had enemies. They had enemies that did not like them, right? The, and notice it says here in, in verse 3, it says, I said to them, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun is hot. What he's saying is, hey, we keep these gates shut at night because there's bad guys who want to come in and do us harm, right? The gates were to be shut. They were to be secured with armed men at the gates and watched well into the morning hours, multiple guards at the gates, one at the gate and one at the guardhouse. That's what it's talking about. So each point, by the way, I think I've got them on here. Eh, it's kind of hard to see. Um, but if you see those little towers around the wall, like there were, there were gates right now. You can, see, you can see one of the gates here, right? There's a gate, there's a gate, there's a gate. So at the gates, that's the most vulnerable. So there would be a guard at his post there, minimum one. And then there'd be a guard, usually there's like a guard house, a little shack or something like that. And there's a guy there for backup, right? Oh, there's somebody at the gate, go! And he stays there to guard. And this guy goes and alerts everybody else and they all rally to the, you know. So it was, it was uh, strategic, right, with that. So, um, and I just want to apply this to us though, okay? So we're going to just take a little shift here. Because we're talking about connecting with God. They were establishing their community, right? They're establishing a safe place, correct? They were united together. They were the, the Israelites are rebuilding the temple. There's a place of worship in there. That's that's that uh, that's the temple area up there. Okay. They had established that safe place there, and, and they were they're worshiping the Lord. And they are shutting out the things of the world. And I think that's a, that's a point I want to draw out of this, okay, is that when it comes to connecting with God, we need, need to shut out the things of the world. Right? If I had a TV over here and it's playing a football game while I'm teaching, that will be a distraction to you, correct? Correct? Now, the football game is not bad, it's not sin, it's not, a, it's not a problem in and of itself. But it would be such a distraction that it would rob you of what? The Word. Correct? You with me? These things are dangerous. They're dangerous. They seem so innocent. I don't, don't feel bad. I'm not. It was literally part of my message, okay? For the record, I'm not picking on you. She's like, I'm front and center, too. I get it. I get I've, I have mine. I know. So, they are, they're, right? Bing, they go up. What do we want to do when our phone goes bing? Who is there? Who's, who's texting me? Oh. Right? We do that. Oh. You know the whole psychological study that was done. This guy named Pavlov, right? He, ding, 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 ding. he had a bell. He had a bell. He'd feed the dog. He'd ring the bell and feed the dog. Read the bell, feed the dog. Ring the bell, feed the dog. Finally, he'd ring the bell and the dog'd be like, ah, "Where's the treat?" He's drooling. He noticed there's a psychological response. Guys, we are no different. Bing. My friends. And some some people get, dare I say, addicted. Right? I gotta have it. I gotta have it. If you can't put your phone down for an hour, you got a problem. And you probably need a detox. I'm serious. You need a detox. You put it away for a week. Put it away for a month. I can't, I can't live like that. Do you know <laughs> that for millennia, <laughs> people lived without these things? Yeah, but you don't understand. I wouldn't be able to. Yes, you can do it. You can absolutely do it. Okay? All that to say is shutting out the things of the world. And it's not just cell phones. It's not just sports. It's not just all those things. It's shutting out the things of the world can be your to-do list for the day. Right? You've got, you've got your needs. And, oh, I got, oh, yeah, today I got to do this, and I got to do this, and I got to do this. And Guys, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Right? You think about the morning. You wake up. What's the first thing you think about? Okay, maybe I got to get going. I got to do it. Time out. Time out. 
That's the things of the world. Not necessarily bad. You have that to-do list. You have to get ready. You need to be engaged. You got to get ready for school. You got to do your homework. You got to prepare. You got to get dressed. Hopefully you can brush your teeth. So your breath doesn't stink. Right? All these different things. You get, but are you taking time and seeking the Lord? Are you connecting first with Him? Your day will be different if you commit to doing that daily. And that requires you to, hold on, let's, we're going to put that on pause. We're going to shut it out. We're going to shut out the things of the world for this little bit. You ever, you ever notice that when you, you go to read the Bible and you're like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to read the Bible. All right. Bing. Bing, bing. Mom. <laughs> Dad. I need to, or you hear an argument. <laughs> Am I alone on this? Or you open the Bible up and all of a sudden you start thinking about, oh, oh I got to, no, no, I got to focus. It's because the enemy knows that when you read this, when you spend time in this word, man, you're going to be equipped and you're going to be connecting with the creator of the universe. And he has a message for you. And he wants to equip you and empower you and strengthen you for all of the day's battles. And the enemy knows that. So he wants you to be distracted. He wants you to be disconnected from God. And he wants the world to crash into your mind with all of its cares and all of its worries and all of its struggles. Guys, it's important to shut out the things of the world. Take, you put yourself in time out, okay? Close the gates, metaphorically speaking, right? Close the gates, man the guard, right? And spend some time with the Lord and then go out to battle. And then go to all those things, right? So, moving on. Um, verse 4. Now the city, Jerusalem, the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people that they might be registered by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return. Talking about um, when Zerubbabel came, probably, right? The first return. He goes, I found, so he finds a genealogy, a, list, a genealogy, a list of names. The, and, the Jewish people still can track their, most of them, can track their genealogy back, 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 back. And, you know, I, go, I come from this tribe, right? It's pretty, it's pretty wild. That, so that geneal genealogical tracking is still alive and well today. And it was alive at this time, you know, meaning that they would, it was important. They wanted to track, which tribe am I part of, you know? Um, so I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return. That would be uh, with the, the return of with Zerubbabel. And they found written, and it says, these are the people, this is what was written. These are the people of the province who came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away from Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his city. Because remember, it's not just Jerusalem. There were these little tinier cities around as well. Okay, so just when you think about this, it's not like everybody is crammed into this, okay? No, that's not what's happening. There's other little cities around as well. You can even see that there's, there would have been houses outside of there, unwalled cities, though, right? Unwalled cities. Jerusalem was a walled city. So if there was problems, I mean, they know that there's an invader coming, you know, and they're miles and miles away, and they would send out people and they'd warn everybody and they could run into the city inside the walls. So much like, a, you know, you ever watch the medieval stuff with the castles, right? And they'd run in, you know, there would be the outer uh, countryside and they would run into the castle, the fortress, and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, verse, well, that's where we're pausing, right there. Okay, so it gives a list. I'm not going to read all the names. <laughs> it gives a list of all of those people. If you want to read it for fun and you love genealogies, <laughs> then feel free. You can, you're welcome to read uh, verses 7 through uh, 72. <laughs> Okay, all you, <laughs> and I am not about to slaughter this many people, but it does give, uh, it does give a whole list. And it's about, uh, if you add up the men and the women and the servants and the workers, it's about 90,000 people. It's about 90,000 people. Not very much, much for a whole area, for a whole region. Okay, and that's what he's talking about there in verse Four, he's like, well, the city was large and spacious. It was like a ghost town. So, like, we rebuilt the walls and the gates and stuff, but there's like nobody here, 
Like there were some people that settled in, but he's like, it's kind of like, it's like crickets in here. And if you consider the other farmlands and they're not being farmed and people aren't, we're not really settling in here. You know, we got to get the word out there that people can come, right? But they had about 90,000 people, men, women, servants, workers, okay? And they needed, to, they, needed to, uh, they were settling into Jerusalem, into the surrounding countryside, the farms and houses and smaller cities, towns we might call them, right? Shepherds, right? Those kinds of things. By the way, based on estimates, okay, that means only, a, remember, where were the Jews before this? They were in, in, what, in what area? They were in Babylon. What's Babylon? Babylon is probably one of the most largest cities at that time in the world. Which means that it was the most well-off. Of course, you had the one of the seven wonders, right? It was the Hanging Gardens there. Very, very lush, very lavish, lavish is the right word. Very well-to-do, very comfortable. And secure from the government. Very comfortable. Most of the Jews are still there. Millions of Jews are stay, stayed in Babylon. They're free. You're free to go. Go back to your homeland. Worship your God. But they stayed in the world. Because it was comfortable. Only about 2% of the Jews based on conservative numbers, made the trip to settle into the promised land. And I'll say this, many Christians fail to enter the promised land, meaning where God, what God wants for you, because it's just more comfortable where you're at. Change is hard. Change is hard. Following Jesus, oh, it's a narrow path. I prefer the wide path. It's easy. It's easier to walk on. That other path looks hard. I might have to camp outside. Oh, bugs. <laughs> I might stub my toe. I don't have the right shoes. Church, come on now. We are not called to comfort. God is far more interested in your character than he is your comfort infinitely more concerned about your character than he is your comfort. We look at Jesus' life. Was Jesus' life comfortable? This is God in the human form. God in the flesh. He could have made his life, he could have put himself in a bubble and still done all the ministry. But you know, when he was hungry, he could have been like, man, I could go for a steak right about now. Bloop. <laughs> you want one? <laughs> you know, he could have done he, it wasn't like that. And if he, did, if he embraced the difficult things to show us the right path, then maybe we ought to as well. Only 2% of these Jews, they're listed. I think that's one of the reasons that Nehemiah has given credit to him. He's like, props to that 2%, man. Unfortunately, you know what I see? You know what I see in today's church? I don't, I'm not picking on you guys. I'm saying the church, okay? Let's just step back a little bit because I think ours is, is different, actually. Um, we see about 2%. 2 to 2% to of a church does the work and is engaged and like passionate and following, like reading your word, praying, asking, for, to, how can I pray for you? I'm getting involved. I'm serving, you know? I'm blessed by you guys because so many of you serve. So many of you are digging in. So many of you are involved in the men's group and the women's group and the youth group on Wednesdays. And just, it's, that's good. Thank you for being, for digging in, guys. But that wasn't the case here, you know. And that's not the case for a lot of Western churches. But the area was underpopulated. Why didn't more come? Cushy life versus godly life. That's just it. I don't want to go out and witness. I'd rather watch a TV show. I don't want to help out over there because, you know, I'd rather sleep in. Anyway, Nehemiah in those, in those uh, uh, you know, 60 plus verses that he records those who boldly made the journey. He goes through all of that, lists them all out there. Uh, in verse 73, we'll pick it back up here. It says, the, so the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers... Some of the people, the Nethanim, 
not Nephilim, by the way, the Nethinim and the Israel and all Israel dwelt in their cities. Now, the the Nethinim were people that were set apart. Nethinim means like uh, isolated for a special purpose, kind of type thing. Nethinim and the Nethinim is believed that they were the people that would do like the menial work for the Levites. They were like the helpers for the Levites. They would go chop the wood for the sacrifices, right? They would go chop the wood. They would go do that. They were the gophers. <laughs> they were the hard labor to support the Levites um, while they were doing all that stuff. So that's, that's the Nethinim for the record. Um, yeah. So back to connecting with God, okay? <clears throat> to connect to God, we need to draw near to him. Again, I'm drawing back, if we, if we see Jerusalem as connecting to God, because that's where the temple was. In the Jewish days, that to be near Jerusalem would be, that would be paramount to that. The temple was the place of worship. It's where God would, would dwell. Of course, at this point, they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was lost at this point, uh, for the record, if anybody wants to know history. But um, all that to say is, but Jerusalem was the place where they would come and you bring your sacrifices there. You would do your festivals there. You know, you'd come up for Passover, you'd celebrate Passover. People would, would, in droves would come to Jerusalem because it was a place to connect with God and to connect with each other, right? And so what, what happens here is people, this, that 2% are drawing near to Him. If you want to connect to God, you need to purpose it to connect to Him. You need to draw near to Him. We're talking about to be intentional, to be purposeful, consistent. Oh, I don't know. God doesn't talk to me. Are you searching? Are you seeking Him out? Well, I prayed. I asked God. Okay. Are you asking Him? Are you continuing to do that? Remember, God is working in you a character. And if He just answer, like if He showed up in, in physical and talked to you every single time, then you're there's no pressing in. He's trying to draw it out of you. Like, hey, learn to talk to me. Learn to press in. Learn to be asking. And when, even when Jesus said, ask, seek, knock, right? Ask, and, and, we'll, and, and, and you'll be uh, answered. You have to seek, and you'll find. Uh, knock, and the door will be open, right? Uh, and so, like, it, the, the, the verbiage that's used there, it's, it's uh, and was it the perfect present? Perfect, the perfect tense? The present tense? Perfect tense. I forget. Sorry. But it's, to be asking, to be seeking, to be um, searching, right? Seeking. To be doing those things, actively doing those things. Not a one-off thing. It's not a, we, we, we got to move away from our, our microwave Christianity where we just, ding, one minute, okay, and I got no time for anything else. Like we need to learn to cultivate and plan and be intentional and, and pursue God. We need to learn to draw near to Him. It's a two-way street, man. We got to connect, just like that battery connection. We got to get that connection right. It wasn't the battery? The battery wasn't the issue. The issue was the connection. So connect to, draw to him, draw near to him every day, every day. You have to. You cannot passively be connected to God. You cannot. You might be saved. You might be in the saved bucket, the saved category, because you, you know, you sincerely you repent of your sins. You accept, receive forgiveness. You came to the Lord. I mean, that, I'm not talking about salvation necessarily. I'm talking about being connected to Him. You want to be connected and know that He's with you. Know that He hears your prayers. Know that He's working in your life. See the fruit of that. If you want that, then you need to purpose it in your life to be drawing near to Him regularly, purposefully. Passionately. Yes. Drawing near to God is it is it is drawing near to God having fellowship with him, with others. Uh, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. I thoroughly enjoy reading the word together with you guys. And I feel connected to God as I'm teaching. I feel connected when we're talking and praying together in men's group and the youth group and all these different things. I feel that. Although we don't just operate on our feelings. <laughs> right? We don't just operate on the feelings. But there is that degree. But I can also connect with God one-on-one. -on -one. I might be by myself in the woods <laughs> connecting with God. Right? 
So the cool thing is, is you don't need to be in a special place. All the places are special because God is everywhere. Amen. Like he's, you can connect with him no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter where you are, no matter who you're with. Draw near to him. All right, next section here. Let's go to chapter 8. No, chapter 8. <laughs> it says here, it says, when the seven, this is right before chapter 8, technically. When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Uh, the wall, this little, if you want to kind of see like where are we at here. Um, remember, from the day that Nehemiah heard the report about the damage of the walls and all that stuff, and then he prayed for like four months, right? And then it was like another couple months, two, three months of prep and logistics and travel and, and work. And then, and, then the, and then they built the walls and the, ta and the towers and hung the gates. Boom, right? So all of it was done within a year, less than a year. Boom, from the start to finish. And now here we are in, the, it says the seventh month came, the children of Israel in their cities. And so um, the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul, that was found, we read about that in chapter 6. That's the sixth month of the, of the Jewish year. And so here we are just a few days later. So the 25th in the previous month is when the wall was completed. And here we are on the, the first of the seventh month, which is just, so we're talking like just a few days later. So a few days later, what we're about to read is what happened. So walls are built, boom, he's like, hey, we need to get, we need to get together, guys, and have a game plan. And we'll read about this right now, Okay. This would be the, the first day of the seventh month with this tish, Tishri, if you want to know, T-I-S-H-R-E-I. -E That's where these events occurred. Okay, verse 1, chapter 8. We're going to read uh, 12 verses. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. That was one of the names of one of the gates. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Verse 2. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read it, they read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose and beside him at his right hand stood Mattathiah, Sherna, Aniah, Urijah, Hilkiah, and Maaseah. And at his left hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. By the way, all those people standing there, they probably might have been... I'm guessing, this is me, they probably were, if you kind of picture it, he was coming, they built this platform. You're trying to talk to all these people. It's a lot of people, right? They gathered everybody together, like, hey, come on, you know. So he built this special platform to be able to speak to them, right? But you've got a long journey, so they would probably spread out a little bit, and he would speak, and then they're repeating it, you know, uh, so to spread the word a little bit. That's my guess. Verse 5. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Remember what just happened, guys? In 52 days, a miracle happened. Okay? <laughs> the walls and gates and towers were rebuilt. That's a miracle. 52 days. So fast. Right? People marveled and they even said, this has got to be a God thing. There's no way. This is other nations. Like, what? It's not possible. How? Right? Plus, just less than a year later, they were still in captivity, not, in, not forced captivity at that point. They were still stuck in Babylon. Wow. They're just worshipful. So much worship. Verse 7. Also, Yeshua, Beni, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Maaseah, Kalita, Azariah, Zochabad, Hanan and Peliah and all the Levites helped the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God and they gave the sense. I like that. They gave the sense. They, 
They get, they help them understand, is what they're saying. They gave them the sense. So every, every Sunday I try to give you the sense. <laughs> and they help them to understand the reading, verse 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep, because all the people wept when they heard the word of the law. Hmm. Why were they weeping, do you think, guys? Mm, no. Good good guess. Why were they weeping when the so remember, you get the picture it. They gather everybody together, okay? He opens up the, the law. So he's got the scroll. This way. <laughs> they read right to left. Boom. And he starts reading. Okay? And he's reading the law. From morning until noon, right? You think I go a long time. <laughs> it's a lot longer. You read the whole th probably read the whole thing. We're talking Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers. Maybe Genesis 2 was in there, right? The law, but it says the law of Moses, so it, 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 those things. So he's reading it. It says they started weeping. Why? Why were they crying when the law was read? Bang! They went, oh, we're not good. Oh, we've been screwing up. Oh... And they just were, con they fell under conviction. I'm not doing what I should be. I'm doing things I shouldn't. And it was heavy. And they started crying as, they, as he's reading through and he says, You'll have no gods before me. You will serve only God. Right? And he talks about, they talk about, well, you look at the ten, first ten commandments. Keep the Sabbath day holy, right? Honor your father and mother. Don't lie, don't steal, don't covet, don't commit adultery. So let's talk about the law would have had sexual sins and giving and parenting and, and uh, practicing your religion and prayer and all of these different things. And they just were like, oh my gosh. You ever, been, you ever hear a message and you're like, I'm feeling like I'm so itty bitty. And I'm like, I want to, oh, it's, it's like it's coming to me. That's God probably talking to you. Receive it, just receive it, just receive it. Let him do his thing. And here's what happened. People wept. And they said, the leaders, look what the leaders said. They go, oh, hold on, hold on, guys. You're in the right place. You're repenting right now. You're weeping. You're, you're weeping in your sin. And you're, you're, you fell under conviction. And you're in this process of repenting and, and letting it go. And they go, today's a day of celebration. Because today's a new day. And if you're here today and you're watching online or you're here, today's a new day, man. Yesterday's yesterday. We're not talking today. God is a God of the now. Right? I am. Who do I tell him I sin? I am. I am. Now. Freedom is found in the Lord in the moment. Sure, he's going to convict you. Listen to that. Receive it. Let it happen. Let it purge you. Okay? And then worship him. Lord, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for the work that you have done, are doing, will do. Right? That's why he says, this, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Verse 10. Then he said to them, Ezra, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet. Send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I'm telling you, that is true. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If you don't have joy, man, look out. Danger. Warning. You better get some joy. You don't manufacture it, by the way. A joy is a fruit of the Spirit, right? Fun fact. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Right? We read that on, on Wednesday. Right, Oliver? We read those about the fruits of the Spirit. One of them is joy. You don't produce joy. You don't. I am joy. It gotta be joy. <laughs> joy it doesn't work. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It's birthed naturally. Okay. You come. You can. You connect to God. You're gonna have fruits of the Spirit. You're gonna have joy. That's what they're reminding them. They're encouraging them. Say, don't stay in that place of defeat. Don't stay in that. 
That's good that you get it. Good that you have good godly sorrow for what you're not doing and what you are doing. If you're messing up, yep. But you know what? Today's a new day. You're one of that 2% who came to settle. You're here. You're receiving it. You're, you're, you're here listening and you're in the right place and you're worshiping the Lord and you're receiving all this. You know what? This is a day for celebration, not mourning. So the Levites quieted all the people, verse 11. They said, Be still, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. They got it. Oh, and the word is good, guys. That's why it's so important to be in it. It's like it, it can encourage you. It can strengthen you. It can, it's going to convict you, though. And that's a good thing. We need to be called out. If, we're, if we mess up and we're doing something, God's going to let us know and say, hey, you need to not do that. You're hurting yourself and those around you. Hey, you, no, 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 you can't bring that into here. That, this is a holy place. You don't do that with me. By the way, we're temples of the Holy Spirit. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. We don't bring sin and compromise into our lives, right? When you do connect with God, make sure that you worship, you praise, and you obey. That's what, that's what was their response. They were there. They made the journey. They came there. They're, they're trying. To, if we see Jerusalem as a picture of connecting with God, that was the place where God would be. When you do connect with God, you want to worship, praise, and obey. That's the first thing they did. It says they bowed their heads and they worshiped. And they said amen, right? They worshiped. They praised God. And then we see that they start to obey. Because they were convicted, they're like, oh man. And then there was a, some action points. And it says that they went out and they followed the leadership, right? They said, hey, go and celebrate and rejoice in the Lord. Go praise Him, go worship Him, go give to those who didn't have anything prepared. Some people aren't as fortunate as you to be able to come here, so go give to them. And let's do that. And we're going to see here, even in the, the end of chapter 8 we're, and, and, and chapter 9, we're going to see this obedience that happens. That is always the fruit. I talk to some people, and they are on fire for the Lord, and they are like, man, that message was great. Oh, baby, I love Jesus, and they're going. But then all of a sudden, there's no application. Rubber meets the road. They just spun out. <laughs> they just stopped. Church, we need to be applying what we learn. Otherwise, it's worthless, completely worthless. I'm not looking to elicit a... A, a, a positive response from you, like where you just have this emotional high. I'm not. That's not the. That's not what leadership is. My job is to equip you for the work of the ministry. Like I said last week, we're not on a cruise ship, guys. This. I, my job is not to make you comfortable. My job is to prepare you for war because we're in one. We are in a spiritual battle every single day. And that, and if you're going to be good at what you do, if you're going to, if you want victory, then you need to apply what you've learned. You need to be equipped and apply the tools. That's hugely important. And that's what these people did. They worshipped him. That's good. It's the emotional. We worship him. Oh, praise you, Lord. They did. They're praying. They're worshipping him. And then they obeyed. And then they put it to work. They put it to action. They were faithful. And we'll see that happen here. If you want to connect with God, when you do connect with them, when you do connect to God, be in worship. Be praising. Be obedient. Be obedient. Be obedient to what he says for you. By the way, if you got questions, text them in. We'll cover them. All of Israel was united as one. They came together. They had that submission. I love it. They worshipped in the reading of the word. For hours, people were attentive. I like that. They were attentive. You know why they were attentive? They were hungry. It says that they were attentive, attentive for hours, standing. <sighs> Some people probably sat down, having to carry your kids up on your shoulders, <laughs> right? Hours. They were attentive, attentive. I've been to concerts two hours, three hours, and you're like, yeah, this is awesome, man. But then all of a sudden it comes to reading the Bible, and you're like, oh, how oh, much longer? What the heck, man? Lord, forgive us for our flesh. Right? Maybe have you guys stand up. I don't know. I'm like, I'll sit down. <laughs> they were attentive. But again, 
it wasn't just like, okay, all right, slam some espresso, get my C4 on, all right, do this, do this, all right, I'm attentive, I'm attentive. No, it's not just you're just like jacked. It's they were hungry. I'm telling you. I was I remember when I was when I first started really experiencing this, I was at I was at Bible college, okay? And I'm, I'm, I was like front and center guy, right? So when I went to the college, uh, university, uh, Western Michigan University, I was like the back of the student, back of the class guy. And then when I got saved, when I went back to college, Bible college, I was front and center, man. And I was, you know, this is back when they had paper. I didn't have laptops. All right, so I'm like ready, my notepad, and I'm taking notes, and I'm flipping over, asking the teacher afterward, attentive. I wanted to get everything. Give me every little bit, man. Give me every little bit. And I saw some students, not every, every time, every once in a while, somebody's going to get tired. I'm not talk, there's a physical limitation. I get that. I'm talking about there was the same students every single week. Mommy and daddy probably made them come or whatever. Hey, you got to at least commit to one semester of Bible college. And then usually that was the case. You'd see them gone the next semester and all that stuff because they, they didn't want it. They weren't hungry. They weren't hungry for it. Are you hungry for Jesus? Are you hungry for him? Did you need him like you need air? Do you need him like you need water? Do you feel when you get like you get dehydrated, you feel you need to get something to food? Are you hungry? I need to get some food. Do you feel that hunger for the Lord? For spiritual things? If you don't, it's like, dude. Come on. Start working on that. I'm telling you. These people were attentive. They were hungry for it. And these leaders were like, hey, great. I will teach you to... I'll tell you what. These, these Levites were equipped. These people were raised up. And it says that they explained it. It says they gave the sense. They helped them to understand the reading. They broke it down. They had all these people, multiple leaders to help equip these people, explain it. And when you guys have questions, for those who have asked questions, am I, am I here for you? Oh, that was, I, I expected a bigger yes. Like, yeah, where are you? <laughs> I am. You know this because I, at the tech, we're getting ready to do questions in a little bit. Questions are good. They let you know that you're hungry and you want to know more. Give me more. Give me more. I want to get this. I want to understand what I'm talking about, what to do. I'm going to understand what it means. I want to understand what to do with this. Right? That's huge. And these leaders were set up for that. And these people asked questions, and they dug in, and then they started getting more convicted, and that's when they're weeping. It's like, oh my gosh, that means that I'm, oh. <laughs> and then they built them up. Man, no, 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 we're going to worship. God's done a good work, and he's going to keep doing a work. Hang in there, right? It ended with celebration and rejoicing that God is loving, he's merciful, and he's gracious. Amen for God being loving, merciful, and gracious. Huh? Isn't that good to know that yesterday is not today? Meaning that it's done, it's in the past, and that God, it is, His mercies are new every single day? You never run out of His grace. You can never run out. Can you drink the ocean? No. <laughs> grace is as big as an ocean, man. His grace for you is as big as the ocean. It never runs out. His love is unlimited. Unconditional. He loves you this much. That he was willing to die for you and take your sin upon him. So yeah, worship, praise, and then obey. Because he's worthy. He's worthy. We were singing about it. He's worthy. All right. A couple action steps and we're done. I'm getting fired up up here. <laughs> All right. Just a review. Okay. If you want to have connection with God, if you don't want to have connection with God, I don't know why you're here right now. <laughs> like it's, if you don't want to connect with God, it's probably not the church for you. Okay. This, you want, I, I, want every, I want you to connect with God, but I can't do that. You have to make the decision. I'm going to be connected to God. I'm going to be connected to him. First thing you have to do, guys, if you don't do this first thing, it will rob you of everything else. It will. And it is robbing you in other areas, probably in some areas, if you're honest with yourself. 
It's definitely robbing people from even finding Jesus because of the distractions. We talked about that last week, right? So last week, distractions, I think. <laughs> now, step number one, if you want to connect with God, you have to shut out worldly things so you can focus on spiritual. You have to find your quiet space. You have to. You have to carve that out. You have to defend it. You have to defend that time. Nope, this is my Bible reading time. Schedule it. Put it down on your Google calendar. Set a reminder on your phone. If you don't shut out worldly things so you can focus on spiritual things, you won't be connected with God. It's going to be that intermittent connection. I think he's there. I know he's there. God? Oh, okay. Oh, You're, you're going to be this roller coaster, man. God doesn't want you to have this roller coaster experience. Life is hard enough as it is. He wants you like, to be solid with Him. Shut out worldly things. This may mean that you need to turn off your phone so you're not distracted. This may mean that you need to turn off the TV. This may mean that you need to go to a special place where there, is no, there are no distractions. Figure out what that is. Be a little bit intentional about this. Carve that, that space out so that you can focus on spiritual things and your spirit is going to be fed. And as your spirit is fed, your flesh is getting what? Youth, we talked about this on Wednesday. Tell me you got something. When your spirit is strong, your what is weak? Flesh. Flesh. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Okay, right? We want, but the problem is, guys, we're like, our flesh is strong. Uh, we're hungry for entertainment. Entertain me. Feed me. Ah, right? We just think about all this stuff, adventure, and do this and that, and all these things. And, and, because your flesh may want to do things that aren't necessarily bad either. They're just, they can get in the way of the spiritual things. We have a flesh, and we have our spirit. Feed your spirit. Okay? Operate off of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But you've got to shut out the worldly things first. Shut out the worldly things first so you can focus now on the spiritual things. Right? You've got to create that space. You've got to create space so you can operate in the Spirit. Okay. <laughs> Number two, purposefully and intentionally draw near and press into God. There is no such thing as a passive Christian. Nope. That's cruise ship. We're not cruise ship Christians. That's passive. Hey, what do you want to do? I don't know. There's a show. There's a buffet. It's all made for me. Just, uh, I don't know. I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to get off the ship. Ah, maybe we'll get off the ship. Yeah, sure. Explore. We're battleship Christians. We're warship Christians. Right? Everybody's got a role to do. Man your post. Be equipped. On time. Get it done. Work to do, do it well. We're depending on each other, right? That's what purposeful, intentional, drawing near to God, pressing into Him. It's, there's no such thing as a passive Christian. You want to be passive, you're going to go backwards with your faith, 100%. 100% of the time, if you become passive. It has to be intentional, and there will be a fight on that because your flesh doesn't want to read the Bible. Your flesh doesn't want to worship. Your flesh doesn't want to get up on Sundays or come on Wednesdays or any other day. Your flesh doesn't want to open up for prayer. Your flesh doesn't want to do ministry. Your flesh doesn't want to share the gospel. Your flesh doesn't want to do any of that stuff. And that's part of you. You're stuck with it. Ah. So God gives you his Holy Spirit. Amen to that. He's made all of the He's made the pathway. He made the connection. He's connected. We're connected. Our fingers like a light socket, plugged into God. Right? <laughs> right? We're plugged into Him. Okay. Purposely, intentionally draw near, press into God. That's the second thing. Last thing is worship, praise, and obey. When you're connected, may your life become worshipful. Worshipful. Not worship empty. <laughs> worshipful. May your life become full of praise for God. And may your life be full of obedience to Him. Because obedience is beautiful because it means that you are receiving it and doing it. That's when you'll be connected to God. Okay? If you're wanting to be connected to God, this is what you do. Amen?